All right, maybe we'll get uh, started. So, um, Lauren is now going to give us a Blackboard talk so we can interrupt with even more questions. Yes. All right, so, um, so the topic of, of this lecture is um, cluster algebras for surfaces. So a surface is something like this. And we're going to have marked points. And um, I don't know, should I start by giving a very quick recap of, um, of, of mutation and cluster algebra? I mean, I don't know if um, there's a few people who... who um, weren't in the first lecture. I don't know. Um, why don't I? Why don't I do this? In the first lecture, I defined quivers and quiver mutation, and I did everything from the point of view of quivers. Now I'm going to switch to the framework of matrices. So I will redefine cluster algebra in a slightly more general setting of symmetrizable matrices. But I'll, I'll do it pretty quickly. So, um, okay. <clears throat> All right. So I'll start by. Defining seed. So it's seed for a cluster algebra A is an initial cluster, which we're basically going to take to be this n tuple of algebraically independent variables plus an n by n skew symmetrizable. symmetrizable integral matrix B. And skew symmetrizable is a slight generalization of skew symmetric. It means that I can find positive integers d sub i such that d i b i j is minus d j b j i for all i and j. So you should think of, so if you like, just think of B as the skew symmetric adjacency matrix of a quiver. That's how this relates to the framework in the first part of our lecture, in the first lecture. And now, if I'm given such a seed, then we have this mutation process where I can mutate in direction one and get a new cluster and new skew symmetrizable matrix and so on. Okay. And just to um, recap the mutation formula, our new seeds are defined as follows. new cluster, um, so, our, so I think give notation for my new seed, UK of the cluster, UK of skew symmetrizable matrix, and the cluster is defined as follows, so UK is exactly so it's all the variables that I had before, except the kth one is replaced by something else. Where xk prime is defined by xk, xk prime is a sum of two monomials, and one monomial has to do with all of the positive entries in my kth column of the matrix. And then I multiply xi to the absolute value of that entry. And my other monomial comes from all of the negative entries in the kth column. And I multiply xi to the absolute value of the ik. So pre in our previous setting with quivers, we were looking at all of the arrows um, incoming and outcoming outgoing of node k 
And when we translate our quiver to its adjacency matrix, or use the slightly more general framework of speed symmetrical matrix, that gets replaced by a sum of two monomials corresponding to the positive and the negative entries in, in column K. In that case, the number of arrows? Yes, thank you. Yes. So in, in our whole setup, whole setup was a quiver Q on N nodes. And that gets mapped to a matrix um, B of Q. This is an N by N matrix where the IJ is the number of arrows. Say the number of arrows from I to J minus the number of arrows from J to I. That's positive or negative based on whether you have incoming or outgoing. Okay. Okay, so this is how our cluster variables mutate, and now the matrix mu K B. by saying that the IJ entry is, so our new IJ entry is the negative of what it was before if I is K or J is K. So that's the equivalent of reversing arrows in the quiver setup. Um, it's BIJ. BIK times BKJ is less than or equal to zero. And otherwise, if this is greater than zero, that means that we have in our quiver a path of length two from I to K to J. And we adjust our entry as follows. So BIK and BKJ are both positive. We have our path of length 2 from I to K to J, and we adjust our entry according to the number of new arrows we'd be adding. Or, if B, I, K, and B, K, J were both negative, then we adjust our entry as follows. Okay. And just as we had before, Mutation is an evolution, and also you can check that if B was <coughs> synthesizable, then the UK of B is again synthesizable. And it's an exercise that if B comes from a quiver, then the definitions that I've given here agree with the definitions I gave. Okay. Okay, and then our definition of cluster algebra is exactly the same as it was before. It's going to be the the ring generated by all all cluster variables. Definition algebra associated to the initial seed. So we start <coughs> what we do. So it's this kind of recursive procedure. We start from our initial seed. And apply all possible sequences of mutations. produces the set this produces a set a priori infinite in general infinite <coughs> cluster variables and then we define our cluster algebra 
algebra, and that's going to be 2b subalgebra of our field of rational functions generated by all cluster variables. everything that we can get as polynomials in our cluster variables. Um, there are more general definitions of cluster algebra that um, involve fancy systems of coefficients, but I don't, I'm not going to go into that today. Okay. All right. So let me do an example. Do the example of rank two plus algebras. Um, so this is going to be like a quiver with two beautiful nodes. So let's let F be the field of rational functions in two variables y one and y two. Do you want the elements of your matrix to be integers? Does it matter? I definitely want them to be integers. Okay, and here's another. Uh, does the Laurent pro property imply that spec of your cluster algebra is toric? Is toric? Yeah, like it um, has a big torus in it. I mean, you have tori. It's not. It's, oh, it's not, not like. It's a... not equidimensional. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> other questions. Okay. So this is a skewed symmetrizable matrix because I can scale my columns by positive integers to make it skew symmetric. And now if you if you um, if you think about what the mutation gives us, um, our cluster algebra. Algebra of F with cluster variables Y sub M, M ranges over integers such that Y sub M minus 1, Y sub M is Y M to the B plus 1 when M is odd, or Y M to the C plus one and m is even. Is that y m minus one? So if... Sorry, is that y m minus one y m? Or, oh, or? sorry. Yes. Okay. So if we were going back to our quiver picture, I would need to make b and c equal. So if we went back to our quiver <coughs> picture, then... Um, I can say in this example, like b equals c equals 3. So let, let me just explain where this comes from, and I'll explain it in a, in a quiver picture. So, um, so this is, um, if b equals c equals 1, then this is exactly the example that I did um, in my last lecture. <coughs> Let me just explain it for a higher B equals C example. So I should take this quiver, and then I could mutate it. And every time I mutate it, all I do is I switch the directions of incoming and outgoing arrows. So if I mutate it in, say, direction 1, I would keep Y2 to be the same. But now, let's call my new cluster variable y3, and y3 would have, so y3 is also what we would call y1 prime. So y1, y1 prime would satisfy the relation, um, would, would equal um, a sum of two monomials, one corresponding to incoming and 
one corresponding to outgoing arrows. So I have no incoming arrows, so I would have one for my one monomial, and my other monomial would have the form y2 cubed. So if I just literally mutated in direction one, my variable here would be called y1 prime, and it would satisfy this relation. Okay, but let's just call let's just call y1 prime y3, and then you see an instance of this, of this relation here. And um, the combinatorics of this example is taking place on an infinite two regular tree. And so if I keep mutating in this direction, um, okay. anyway, let me not go into too many details, but since our combinatorics is taking place on an infinite two regular tree, um, you can either mutate backwards or forwards. And so our, our cluster variables are naturally parameterized by the integers, and they will exactly satisfy this recurrence. Is that reasonably clear? Questions? Okay. Okay, but this, this formulation with the V and the C, um, this Q symmetrizable formulation, is a little bit more general than the quiver formulation. So in this example, our cluster variables we call the y sub n. Our exchange relations are are these um, <coughs> clusters are going to be two are going to be any two consecutive um, cluster variables. And our infinite two regular tree or our exchange graph. Start with our initial cluster, which is um, we call it y1 and y2. And then we can mutate in each of two directions, and in one direction we can mutate y1 and call our new variable y3, and then we call y3 y2, and in the other direction we can mutate, and I'll hold on to the y1, but I'll replace y2 with something else, which I'll call y0. And then we can keep going. Um, here I would um, hold on to the 3 and replace 2 by a new variable that I'll call y4. And so Okay. So let me do, um, yeah, so if we go, Coincide with the example that I did in the first lecture, and we will get um, um, we'll get a finite type cluster algebra, and our infinite two regular tree will close up on itself and give this pentagon. Now the if to do with um, a cluster algebra associated to an annulus with 
two marked points. So that's that's where we're where we're going to go. Okay. So let me let me now um, start talking about surfaces and cluster algebras from surfaces. In our previous setup with triangulations of a polygon, um, our boundary was the boundary of the polygon, and we had n marked points on the boundary, and we didn't have any punctures. And um, in that setup, we talked about diagonals of the polygon, but now that will be replaced by arcs in the surface. So an arc, gamma, is s comma m. Curve in S considered up to isotopy. So I can deform my curve, but not past a puncture or past, you know, um, not past a marked point. And my requirements are that um, the endpoints of gamma are in the set of marked points. There are no self-intersections of gamma, except possibly at the endpoints. And gamma should not be contractible into M or onto the boundary of S. So maybe I should start drawing some pictures. So um, so I'll draw I'll draw another annulus but with more marked points. And um, so this is an example of an arc that I'm happy with. Um, the endpoints of, of gamma are in M. Um, I would not 
I would not allow. Um, I would not allow something like this with self intersections. And I also don't want gamma to be contractible into the set of Marsh points. So this stuff is bad. So I would not allow something like this. On the other hand, if I had a, a puncture here, this arc would be totally fine. Um, and I also don't want gamma to be contractible onto the boundary. <coughs> On, on the boundary, so I would not allow an arc like this because I would consider this to be contractible onto the boundary. Okay. And then we're going to say that two arcs are compatible <coughs> if they don't. of S. Okay, so just like in a triangulation of a polygon, you don't want two crossing arcs here. Uh, we don't want two arcs that are intersecting, except at a, at a boundary point. Okay, so. so my surface might be torus. This would be one perfectly good arc, and this would be another, and they don't intersect in the interior, so those are compatible. Okay, and then we'll say that an ideal triangulation. is a maximal collection of distinct pairwise compatible arcs. So going back to the annulus with two marked points, um, one possible triangulation would be something like this. <coughs> not a good example because it's too it's too hard to actually see what's going on. I, I, I did want to stick with this example because I know some of you like it. Let me draw a much easier triangulation so I don't confuse myself. Here's one arc and um, here's here's um, like another one. No, no, it, it ends I'll go back to the intermediate yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right. So here's a simpler triangulation for annulus. Now, okay, so now how do we associate a seed to a surface? Um, actually, before I do that, let me talk a little bit more just about triangulations. Because triangulations of surfaces with punctures can be weird. So, um, so when there when there's punctures. very small picture. So here, 
Okay, so here my surface is going to be a um, triangle with one function. So I have four marked points, and I've chosen a triangulation of it. And let me label my marks like this. And now let's start. Um, let's start trying to flip arcs in triangulations, just like we did in the case of the polygon. So let's start by trying to flip one. I still have my polygon with the marked point. And if I flip, so how did we flip before? We looked at a quadrilateral, and there were two ways of triangulating that quadrilateral. So one, arc one, is a diagonal in this quadrilateral with sides this, 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 and this. And so I can replace it with this diagonal instead. stay the same, and we can call this one prime. And now let's flip two. And that means we're going to keep one and three the same. And now I have to think of two as a diagonal in a quadrilateral. And how do I do that? Well, okay, I can sort of think of this as one side of the quadrilateral, and this as another, and this as another, and this as another. Okay, so then these are opposite vertices, and this is kind of opposite to itself, and when I flip this, I replace it with this arc here. Okay, so now I have another triangulation. And I'll call this one this yellow one two prime. But now I'm sort of in a bind because I want to flip arc three, and it's really not clear how to think of three as a diagonal inside a quadrilateral. Right. So this this is this is a weird situation, and it looks like there's absolutely no way to think about arc three as a diagonal in a in a quadrilateral. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> So this little yellow thing here is bounding what's called a self-folded triangle. It's kind of like a triangle where um, two sides got, got identified. Okay. All right, so we're going to come back to that problem momentarily. Um, but first I want to now explain how to associate a cluster algebra to a triangulation. Okay, so... Um, so suppose our ideal triangulation has n arcs, and now we're going to associate a matrix of, let's call our triangulation T, let's associate an exchange matrix V of T um, to our ideal triangulation. And it's easiest when there's no self-folded triangles. So for the purpose of this definition, um, I will assume there's no self-folded triangles. Okay. You can make the definition in the case where there's self-folded triangles, but um, I don't want to go into that at the moment. Okay, and now this is our definition. So V of T is going to be an n by n matrix where cij is the number of triangles with sides i and j with j following i in clockwise order draw a picture to show what I mean by that. I mean a triangle like this. Go around clockwise and J follows I minus the number of triangles with sides I and J with J following I in counterclockwise order. So this 
focuses away to associate a skew symmetric matrix to a ideal triangulation. And if we have a skew symmetric matrix, then we have a cluster algebra. This gives an exchange matrix. Um, and roughly speaking, <coughs> the things you expect to be true by analogy with um, the polygon remain true. So let me write down. Let me write down the kind of thing you hope is true. Um, our surface with marked points, and we got a cluster algebra. Um, okay. And calculation T, and then we can get our, our cluster algebra associated to the data of our surface of triangulation. And the theorem and um, version of this theorem is due to Sami Shapiro Thurston. Um, the first statement is that the cluster algebra doesn't depend on our choice of triangulation. And, and roughly speaking, and this is going to be literally true when there's no punctures, But as I pointed out here, we have a little problem when we have punctures because then we can have slip slope folded triangles. So now what I want to do is just explain um, how we fix how we fix this problem and how we kind of enlarge the combinatorics on the left hand side. Yes? Sorry, can you say what the example is which returned to the thing in your previous lecture, just the polygon of the diagonals? Is that just a disk with no punctures and end mark points on the boundary? Exactly. But now if I draw a diagonal, why can't I contract it to the boundary? Oh, um, so, so these are marked points. So I would only... Oh, it would interrupt the mark points. It would, yeah, it would, it would interrupt this marked point. Yeah, so I would consider this to be contractible onto the boundary, but not this one. Okay, thanks. More questions? Okay, so okay, so the question, so this is literally true if there's no punctures, but we have a problem with punctures um, with this correspondence. So we have to enlarge this combinatorics to um, if we want um, if we want an actual bijection. Okay, so um, let me explain how to do that. So um, let me sort of redraw um, the sort of essence of the problem here. So um, if we have a puncture, then we get this kind of a problem. So this is a dive on, and if I flip in one direction, If I, if I flip this arc, then I'll preserve the bottom arc, and the top one will be replaced by this. And on the other hand, if I keep this 
top are fixed, and I flip the bottom one, I'll get this. So this is this is our problem. Uh, so so yeah. So our problem is that um, from either of these situations, we would like to mutate. Uh, we would be able to mutate. Should be able to mutate in all directions. So I should be able to mutate at this arc um, from either of these situations. So all right. So the answer to this problem of self-folded triangles comes from Homi Shapiro Thurston. And it says to um, it says to augment arcs and ideal triangulations with tagged arcs and triangulations. So what we're going to do combinatorially is we're going to take our problematic situation. So this is an ideal triangulation. And I'm labeling this, I'm calling this arc here, R. And I'm going to, I'm going to map this picture to the following one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm, I'm now going to disallow self-folded triangles in the new world of tagged arcs as tagged triangulations, but I'm going to record this arc here as an additional, as an additional um, arc between these two points, but with a little tag as a function. Okay. So this is an ideal triangulation. And this is a tag triangulation. And um, in this situation here, I'm going to allow two kinds of flips. So from this situation, So this is a little, this is a way of um, enlarging my combinatorics um, to get around this problem. So let me, maybe I should keep this situation here. Um, so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm taking this combinatorics and I'm replacing self-folded triangles by pairs of tagged arcs at a puncture. So this picture here will literally get mapped to the top one stays the same. And then um, this thing maps to this. And now this loop here gets mapped to this tagged arc. And then going from this picture, I'm going to keep this top arc like this. And then this sort of loop is going to be replaced by this. And now if I flip, so to get from here to here, I flip this top arc, getting this. And so if I were to flip the yellow arc, I'll go back to this picture. But now if I flip the white arc instead, I'm going to keep the yellow and the white one will get mapped to, the, to this arc. 
And similarly, from this picture here, if I flip the yellow arc, I'll go back to this picture. But if I flip the white arc, I will get this picture here. So this is a way of enhancing our combinatorics to allow for flips um, at every single arc. Sorry, quick question. Sorry, I, I can pull it. Uh, <coughs> the flips of the type triangle, I should say. Oh, how does the flip work? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if I'm in a situation with um, where I have a digon and I have two um, arcs, which are two, so, okay, let's, let's call this kind of arc a radius, which is going from the puncture out to the boundary point. And um, so, so the situation that corresponds to having a self folded triangle is having a digon and two arcs which connect the same two points. They're both like radii, they're isotopic, but they have different tacking. And now if I flip either one of them, I'm going to um, replace it by the other arc of the digon and I'll change its tagging. So now we're going to have arcs which have an additional data of possibly having a little tag next to the function. <coughs> Does that make sense? Can you get it um, to have two tags coming down there? Um, so what we're going to wind up with is what look like honest triangulations with the exception that sometimes we'll have two isotopic arcs like this with opposite taggings, or we might have situations like this, and in this case, the tagging around the function will always be the same, either no tagging or everything. Okay. All right, so let me just say a little bit about why you might care about cluster algebras. But, but, but both sides of the arc can be tagged. I mean, if you had two. Both sides can be tagged, yeah. yes. Was that, the, was that the question earlier? Um, both sides can be tagged. If this were a puncture out here, then you could have a tagging at both at both points. Yeah. Okay, so why would we care about these cluster algebras from surfaces? So, one is that there's an interpretation in Fetriona theory. But also, the, this class of cluster algebra is quite large. So, the theorem of Felixson to Markin Shapiro says that all but 11 of the mutation finite skew symmetric cluster algebras are either rank two or come from surfaces. And um, so, okay, this is our picture of all cluster algebras in the universe, and we have this small number of finite type cluster algebras, which means finitely many um, cluster variables. And then we have a bigger class of mutation finite cluster algebras, which means you only have finitely many quivers, finitely many exchange matrices. So you might, so in this, in this region of our little Venn diagram, we have infinitely many cluster variables, but only finitely many quivers. Okay, so this is the next most controllable class of cluster algebras, and what they're saying is that Essentially, all of them come from surfaces. And then out. Here we have everything else. So with these mutation finite guys, you could have different arcs, different quivers with different cluster variables for the same quiver, depending on how you get there. Is that the yes. point? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. Yes. Okay. And, sorry, are you saying that all surfaces give you mutation finite guys? Yes. Okay. Can you have wild punctures? What do you mean by wild punctures? Uh, I mean, I assume this comes from somewhere like a brain configuration or something, and this is if you have stacks of brains of the punctures. Alternatively, this is probably related to a hedge system, and the punctures are related to some kind of hedge systems, and again, you can have wild punctures which relate to irregular singularities or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I yeah, assume I there's a generalization of this. Just, okay. Huh. Okay. I, yeah, I don't know about that. I can talk after 
that. In that case, for the SU2 case, it's just given by a disk with marked points. The yeah, number of marked points is related to, to, the, to how wild the puncture is. I see. So you can like just kick the wildness of the pit and then so you just up. put another disk. Okay. You have additional marked points. Do you know that those guys are still mutation finite in general? Some of them are, because some of them correspond to actually the, the Let's see. Okay, so let me um, let me tell you um, more nice things about these cluster algebras, and um, maybe I'll tell you something about how they how cluster variables mute. Um, well, okay, what kinds of relations we have apart from the exchange relations? So, um, so relations. Cluster variables are given by smoothing. So, for example, if you have two arcs like this, and um, I don't know, there could be like other marked points out here, or whatever, then um, you get an exchange relation that's that's um, exactly that has two terms. So you have a relation that comes from smoothing these, this crossing in two ways. things really nicely, um, and um, <coughs> let's see, and, uh, and in general, you can write down, you can write down um, the Laurent expansion for every, for every single cluster variable. So, um, so let me say a little bit about how it goes. So a theorem that we proved with Ray Musiker and Ralph Schiffler is um, for any surface and any triangulation T consisting of arcs tau 1 through tau n. Um, <coughs> and for any for any arc gamma. In S, we can compute X gamma in terms of the cluster associated to this population, X tau 1, X tau n, as a sum over perfect matching. I'll just show an example of how that works. So this gives a uh, manifestly positive combinatorial formula for all of our cluster variables. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's do an example. So I'll take a polygon with puncture. And I'll choose some triangulation. One, let's label the arcs of our triangulation. One, two, three, four, five, and six, and now let's take some arc that's cutting across them that represents some other cluster variable. to write down the formula for this particular variable is I'm going to write down a simple um, bipartite graph, which is defined as follows. We will associate a tile, bj, which is a little bipartite graph like this. Well, I'll think of it as bipartite. It's got 
four vertices to each intersection point, P sub J of gamma T. Um, these triangles are going to be labeled according to what, um, to where I am locally inside this triangulation. So, all right. So here's my arc gamma that I'm interested in. It represents some cluster variable. I've chosen arbitrarily some orientation, and I'm just going to look at how it cuts across my triangulation. And it cuts across it in four different points. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, so this is the first intersection point, and I'm going to put down a little tile corresponding to that intersection point. And the first arc it intersects is one. So I'm going to put one here. And then I'm going to, um, the first triangle, so I'm going to think of, this is our starting point. As I follow my yellow arc, the first triangle I see has three sides, this one, this one, and one. And then when I keep on going, the next triangle I see has sides in clockwise order one, two, and five. So I'll put one, two, and five. So I've drawn my labels consistent. Um, the orientation here is consistent with the orientation I saw here. Now at the next instant, I'm going to draw another tile like this whose diagonal is labeled by the, the next point of intersection, which is 2. And I'm going to put it either up here or up here. And I, my choice is going to be totally determined by the desire to not have two adjacent edges of my triangle labeled by 2. So I'm, I can't put it up here because the next diagonal that I draw is going to have labeled 2. And I don't want this 2. So I'll draw here, labeled by 2. And then again, um, the first triangle that I go through is C's 1, 2, 5 in clockwise order. But now I have to actually switch orientation. I'm going to kind of switch my relative orientation. So 1, 2, 5 will appear in the opposite order. And on the other side, I see 2, 3, 5. And so I'm going to put 2, 3, 5 here. The next point of intersection that I see is arc 3. So I'm going to put on another tile with a 3 as its diagonal. And I can't put it over here, otherwise I would have two adjacent 3s. So I'll put it here. And I'm going to basically copy what I saw before. So the first triangle that I saw as I approached this intersection was 2, 3, 5. And the second triangle on the other side is 3, 6, 4. Three, six, four. So I'm going to keep going. The final point of intersection I see is this 4. And we're going to wind up putting a 4 here. 4. So as we approach this point of intersection, we saw 3, 6, 4. It's going to be this triangle. And on the other side of the point of intersection, 4 and then these two boundaries boundary um, vertices. Okay, so now how do I read off my Laurent expansion from this graph? So let me redraw it. So I'm going to think of this as a bipartite graph. And I'm going to ignore diagonals. So what I'm going to do is so my expression for x gamma theorem says that x gamma is the weighted sum of all the perfect matchings m of this graph g, it's called this g gamma t, m is a matching of g gamma t, all divided by the arcs that I crossed, 1, 2, 3, 4 all divided by x1, x2, x3, x4. So in this picture, one of my perfect matchings would have been like this, say. And then I would have said that the weight of this perfect matching 
was x2, x3, x6. But in this case, I would have, I don't know, maybe four other nothings, and so I would get four other terms. And this would be the expression for my, for my cluster variable. All right, what's a perfect match? Yeah. Oh, a perfect matching. So let's think of this as a, as a bipartite graph. And then a perfect matching is going to be um, a collection of edges of the graph so that every single vertex is incident to exactly one edge in my collection. So every single vertex in this graph sees, is incident to exactly one yellow edge. So one can get formulas for um, all of these cluster variables, and um, you know, is it okay if I take five more minutes? Um, so apart from so apart from understanding um, apart from understanding um, the cluster variables of your algebra, you would also like to understand a linear basis for this algebra. And um, so you would also like to understand, find some kind of basis. And, um, and you hope that it has the following properties. This means like a linear basis, meaning that every single element in the algebra can be expressed as a linear combination of basis elements. So desired properties include you want B to contain all cluster monomials, meaning um, all monomials whose support lies in one cluster. You also want that um, each element in your basis is a positive Laurent polynomial in the variables of each cluster. And you'd also like that products, um, so for any two elements in your basis, product is a positive linear combination. Okay. Now, I should say, for general cluster algebras, there is this canonical basis of gross hacking key and savage using the framework of scattering diagrams and um, theta functions and broken lines, um, which, is, which has all of these beautiful properties. But it has one little problem, which is that it's really, really hard to compute. So if you're working with a cluster algebra um, where you, you're coming from a quiver with n nodes, you have to first come up with some kind of scattering diagram in n dimensions and start thinking about the geometry of broken lines in n dimensions. It's very hard to compute. But in this case of surfaces, there's a very nice um, simple basis where you can write down everything about it. Here's a basis that you can write down for any cluster algebra from the surface. Okay. <coughs> so our cluster variables correspond to arcs and tagged arcs in the surface. And um, so to get so so our basis will consist of so our basis consists of cluster monomials, monomials with their support in one cluster, plus some elements associated to curves, closed curves.
cluster monomials, for example, if one of the cluster variables was like 1 plus x1 over x2, would the monomials be 1 over x2 and x1 over x2? Um, is that 1 plus x1 over x2? Yeah, just like the original example you gave. Okay. Yeah. Right, and the other one like X1? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Right, right, so then cluster monomials would be... Oh, just those two dudes? <laughs> this to the A times this to the B. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, Great. yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so that's um, But they have to be in the same cluster. Okay. They need to be in the same cluster. Yeah, so let's draw our picture of annulus again. And we've got these closed curves like so. And you can also associate an algebraic quantity to this closed curve. And you can do it um, along the lines of what I just said here. You can also express it in terms of perfect matchings of some kind of graph. Um, and we're also going to allow self-intersections. So I can take this curve, and I'm now going to repeat. I'm going to wind around as many times as I want. So we, we took gamma. So let's this gamma is an essential, let's call it an essential loop because it has no self-intersections. And then we're going to call this the bracelet. The bracelet um, I wrapped around three times, so I'll call it bracelet sub three of gamma. Okay. So now you can get a um, So now you can get a basis by um, augmenting cluster monomials to include um, all bracelets attached to essential loops. Can you intersect as much as you want? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so we're going to, um, yeah. So we can augment our um, basis. Um, yeah, from cluster monomials by adding by adding bracelets. And okay, there's there's some technicalities I need to say. I don't want my bracelet to to only close one puncture. Um, but um. Anyway, these things can be expressed exactly as before. Perfect matchings of some kind of bipartite graph, except now you've sort of identified the end and the beginning. And, um, and I'll just end by saying one very pretty thing, which is um, something that is easy to check, which is that if gamma is an essential loop, and um, so Chebyshev polynomials express bracelets in terms of the essential loop. If gamma is an essential loop, then x, the cluster variable associated to the kth bracelet of gamma, is exactly the kth Chebyshev polynomial in x gamma, where tk is the kth Chebyshev polynomial. Defined by, um, defined by tk of t plus y over t is t to the k plus y to the k over t to the k, and capital Y is the product of arcs in our original triangulation weighted by the number of crossings. I want you to come away with is that cluster algebra surfaces are a very large class of cluster algebra. They're essentially all of the mutation finite cluster algebras, and yet we can basically say everything about them. We can say explicitly everything we want to say about the cluster, cluster variables, about um, bases for them, and um, we do have infinitely many cluster variables, but they're sort of infinite in a controllable way.
I'll say more about this example tomorrow. Okay. So, since you put it so, so fast. Just about the phrase that it has to, it has to enclose uh, just uh, one. Um, so it shouldn't be contractible. Yeah, but can, can it enclose more than one uh, puncture? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And so, so we so don't allow it to, con to only include enclose one puncture, but it can enclose anything else. And so you, you, you're not allowed. So you're, you're saying you're not allowed to smooth those pictures at all. This, these essential bits, you're not allowed to smooth by your. So we could we could smooth them out. But if you just want to say what's in the basis. No, no, I mean, sense. like if you fix the triangular, if you fix some reference triangulation, you draw an essential loop, and then you smooth it with respect to the crossings. Yes, you can do that to give an expression for it. In terms for the of loop, loop in terms of the yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can smooth sort of everything you hope to be able to smooth. Uh -huh. The gross typing field can save its canonical basis in this case to agree with this or not? Yeah, that's a very good question, and there's some work in that direction, and probably yes. Okay. So there's actually three different bases for cluster algebras from surfaces, and with um, Musiker and Schiffler, um, we studied the most obvious basis, which we call the Bengals basis, um, and we didn't have these bracelets, but instead we had multiple copies of these essential loops on top of each other, so they were like, bangle. <laughs> and, um, and then, and then um, so that, that was, uh, that's the most sort of obvious basis you might write down. Bracelets is a little bit more obvious and has better um, positivity properties. And then Dylan Thurston wrote a paper um, after that, and he introduced yet another basis, which he called the BAMS basis. And, um, but uh, I think the feeling is that this bracelet one should Probably coincide with gross second, but it's not been checked in general. What are the other 11? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so um, Felix and Shapiro Tamarkin um, wrote down like the quivers for the other 11, and uh, you can look up the list. And I think they had occurred perhaps in one other context. I would not be able to just like draw them on the board for you, though. What are the dimensions? Do you remember how big did they get? Just curious. No, I don't remember. This question might be really ill motivated since I'm a geometer instead of a combinatorialist, but what happens once you find a cluster algebra? Like, if there's a problem you really care about and you're like, wow, this ring seems to be a cluster algebra, does this motivate new questions to ask about it? Does it help solve other old questions that you might have already wanted to ask? Um, what happens? I mean, um, so. So, oh, well, I did, yeah, I didn't have time to say. Um, I mean, sometimes you match things up with things that were studied before. So in this case, the cluster algebras from a surface exactly coincide with the decorated lambda lengths introduced by Penner associated to surfaces like 30 years before. Okay. And so, I mean, you can say new things about these Penner or lambda, decorated lambda length coordinates. I mean, you know, basically, once you have a cluster algebra, you, you know you have all of this structure like the Laurentness and the positive Laurentness. So you have structure that you probably didn't know existed, and you, um, yeah. Um, did Penner have the tag darks? He did not have the tag I, darks. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that was I hate the tag so darks. But. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was the key innovation. Any other questions for Lauren? All right, then we'll meet back here for one uh, at uh, one thirty. Um, uh, just a little announcement: uh, there's gonna um, uh, there's gonna be actually a class in here from uh, noon to one fifteen or so. So uh, so feel free to go around upstairs, but uh, um, unless you want to hear about uh, conformal and dual conformal invariants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh,